Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Harold Garfinkel, Video 1. In this video, I've got three goals. First, I want to explore the life and work of Harold Garfinkel. Next, I want to look to Harold Garfinkel's 1967 book, Studies in Ethnomethodology. Finally, I want to get you ready to do the readings. Let's get started. Garfinkel founded ethnomethodology. What do we mean by this giant word? Let's break it down into three key components. First, we have ethnos, Greek for nation. We'll take it to mean people or folk. Next, method, in reference to the ways, means, or procedure employed to a particular end. And finally, logos, in terms of the reason or study of something. So we can say that ethnomethodology is the method that folk use to accomplish things. What exactly? Well, social order. When we're talking about ethnomethods, we are talking about the practical accomplishment of society and how people keep it going. Thus, I've given you the image of the plate spinner right there, an image that I want you to consider as we go through the lecture. Social order is an ongoing practical accomplishment, and we keep it going through folk methods. As we go through this material, I want you to think about social order as spinning plates. I'm going to keep using this metaphor in reference to the practical nature of social structure. We are always doing it and maintaining social order in our mundane acts. Social order isn't something that just restricts our behavior, but is a constantly achieved outcome. Here's a quote from Ann W. Rawls, one of Garfinkel's students. We read, The word ethnomethodology represents a very simple idea. If one assumes that the meaningful, patterned, and orderly character of everyday life is something that people must work constantly to achieve, then one must assume that they have some method for doing so. What does she mean by this? Well, we can think about the image before you. In order to keep the plate spinning, to keep the circus going, we have to employ a method, a delicate touch. If you ask the person doing the performance to explain to you how to spin a plate, he'd probably say, I can't tell you, you just need to do it. In this constant performance, in this just doing it, he keeps the show going. He's part of a group, an ethnos, who knows what they are doing, but cannot articulate it. The goal of ethnomethodology, logos, is to study it, to repeat. Ethnomethodology is the study of folk methods for accomplishing social order. I want to explore what ethnomethodology is by looking to the career of its founder, Harold Garfinkel. So here I've given you a personal timeline of Garfinkel's life and a timeline of three projects. In his personal life, we're going to see how his thought developed alongside the other thinkers we looked at to this point. While Garfinkel presents us a radical understanding of what sociology is, he took conventional channels in producing it. In each of his three projects, I want you to see the development of his way of thinking about social order as a routine accomplishment, one that we can study. So first, who is this guy? Garfinkel was born in 1917, meaning that his youth was spent during the Great Depression. Living in Newark, New Jersey, Garfinkel's father was a shop owner, selling furniture. Harold had dreams of a university education, but his father said that surgeons and lawyers were driving taxi cabs, and that he was destined to take over the family shop. So he signed up for Newark College, for an unaccredited program where graduate students from New York City, across the river, would teach courses. Here, he takes a course in accounting, called Theory of Accounts, that changes his life forever. From early on, he was learning about how different actions are made accountable to order. From accounting, accountability. The accountant is accountable to bookkeeping, in the same way as the circus performer is accountable to the plates. In my reading, accountability is the key concept to understanding Garfinkel, so I'm going to beat this metaphor into the ground. In the practice of accounting, we have an order that we subject reality to. Different accounts in which all acts that the business engages in are held accountable. You spend 40k on wages, you have to account for it. Your employee leaves the taps on just to cost the company money, you got to account for it. Now, books don't just represent reality, they shape it. A company in a good financial situation is more attractive to buy than another. Or books can be misrepresented. They aren't simply reflective of reality, they produce it. So in thinking of how a business budgets, we are also producing reality. Garfinkel didn't want to state his father's business. He's able to escape by doing a master's degree in sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, 
1939. A notable historical event happens while Garfinkel's at UNC, World War II. He enlists in the Air Force, though with a university degree, becomes tasked with the goal of teaching people how to fight tanks with small arms. Of course, there weren't any real American tanks in Miami, Florida at the time. They were in France. Garfinkel had never even seen a real tank, but had to organize groups of people to know how to fight them. It is hard, I should say, to be accountable to a tank's size when you haven't even seen one. How does one give an adequate description of action around an invisible tank? While at UNC, Garfinkel studies racial dynamics in the southern United States, looking particularly to inter- and intra-racial homicide, and how homicides by different races are accounted for differently by police departments, prosecutors, and juries. He would later write a paper on this in Social Forces, Research Notes on Inter- and Intra-Racial Homicides. How do juries, this time in 1939-1940, account for murder crimes depending on the race of those so accused, and who they kill. How are they made accountable for the crimes? Again, in the intraracial homicides work, the theory of accountability continues. The job of the jury is not only to do the work of finding out if a particular crime happened or not. It is also to come up with a convincing enough story for other jurors to believe, to come up with a verdict along the letter of the law and the onus of evidence. Just like in Weberian sociology, we need to come up with a good enough picture of motivations that may or may not have caused someone to act in a premeditated murder kind of way. The ways that juries use racial backgrounds as part of that process is what interests Garfinkel. Here race isn't so much socially constructed, in so much as it is used as an explanatory tool to make a particular understanding of reality convincing. It isn't made up as much as it is making up a definition of reality. A familiar figure pops up next. After the war, Garfinkel decides that he should do his sociology PhD with none other than Talcott Parsons at Harvard University's Department of Social Relations. Parsons, then and now, is the sociological system builder in contrast to Garfinkel. And this tension between Parsons' formal analysis and the small-scale sociology Garfinkel is trying to do takes shape in this environment. Even though they have very different understandings of what action is and how to study it, the interest in action remains. I'll emphasize the differences between Parsons and Garfinkel's theorizations of social action and social order in the next slide. For work, I've already mentioned Garfinkel's unfortunate job teaching people to fight invisible tanks. After Harvard and a dissertation of approximately 800 pages, four times longer than mine, Garfinkel gets a job on a jury study in Wichita, Kansas observing how juries came up with accounts of a crime in the deliberation room. Accountability, again. Like Goffman's asylum, so pretending to be the sporting director's assistant, I'm sure you can't do this anymore. You can't tape record jury deliberation. Regardless, in preparing a paper for the American Sociological Association in 1954, they came up with the name Ethnomethodology for the work they're doing. In fall 1954, Garfinkel gets a job at UCLA, where he stays until his retirement in 1987. To get a good understanding of what Garfinkel's trying to do in studies and ethnomethodology, we have to take a philosophical detour through phenomenology. I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Ethnomethodology is very much influenced by the philosopher Edmund Husserl. As a phenomenologist, Husserl is interested in how we apprehend objects of consciousness and the study of how we do so. If any of you make the terrible decision to go to graduate school, you can read Husserl. Here I'm just going to give you a big description of his 1936 book, The Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology. In that book, Husserl is trying to outline how we make meaning together and how we think together. The European sciences, Husserl argues, are in crisis because they've forgotten that all of the scientific entities we take for granted were in fact shaped in the shared world and not the other way around. We have forgotten that before things were scientific truisms, they emerged in the life world, a place of shared meaning. Let me give you an example. Think about measurements. Now, we treat inches and centimeters as if they were real, objective entities, not ones that are assembled together. But Husserl argues that we came up with the meaning for these entities together through collective convention. Consider my buddy Oliver from Germany. I asked him how tall he was. 
He said 180 centimeters. I don't know about you, but I can't do the quick math to figure out what that is in inches. Here, my point is the way that we've carved up the world into individual, scientifically measurable things came to be in a particular time and place, and that has shaped how we look at the world. This, for our purposes, is enough to understand Husserl's project. Scientific entities take shape in the life world. First, they are accountable to us. One of the major works of phenomenological sociology comes in Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman's The Social Construction of Reality. Following Durkheim, we sociologists don't really care about philosophical questions, about the nature of truth, or how we should act. We want to describe what people are doing. We care about collective action and how we make that action meaningful. These two guys, in The Social Construction of Reality, try to connect Weber and Durkheim with Husserl's project. They want to understand how we make meaning in subjective and objective ways. They offer an interpretive contrast to the work of Talcott Parsons. Remember, Parsons wants an objective science of social systems combining Durkheim and Weber. Berger and Luckman, by contrast, want to look at how we make meaning together, again focusing on Weber and Durkheim. Berger and Luckman apply Husserl's focus on the everyday world and look at how reality is a social product. How do we make meaning individually and how is our experience a social product? How do we come up with objective institutions, like language or marriage, and how do we make these meaningfully individually? This is the basis of that book. Now, Garfinkel is a follower in this tradition, insofar as he wants to find out how we make meaning. But he doesn't want to do it by sitting in an office and theorizing it. He wants to show how we make meaning in everyday scenes of social life, like Goffman. Garfinkel is going to read this space as a place of accountability, as the three projects I discussed in his personal timeline showed. This is where he gets Durkheim and Husserl working together in the place of practical, meaningful, ethical accountability. Let's contrast the ways that Parsons and Garfinkel read Durkheim. Parsons is trying to come up with a general, systematic theory of social action, whereas Garfinkel is trying to discover the ways that we make social order continue, how we are accountable to it. Parsons' work is a mix between Weber and Durkheim, but is inspired a great deal more by the work of Weber. The only major difference between Parsons' work and the work of Max Weber is that Weber doesn't think we can come up with general laws explaining collective behavior. Parsons, following Durkheim, does. In this reading, Durkheim is interested in the objective reality of society, and Weber is interested in how it is meaningful. When we think about morality, we think about it from the Weber perspective. How does it inform our conduct? Now Garfinkel understands the project that Durkheim is trying to do differently. Our basic principle that of the objective reality of social facts. It is therefore upon this principle that in the end everything rests and everything comes back to it. It is to social facts that we are accountable, like the organization of a circus and the organization of a jury room. The social order is the moral order, and it exists outside of consciousness because we can't express, just like the dude with the spinning plates, exactly the mechanisms that are used in perpetuating it. Parsons thinks that we can establish formal categories to describe action, his modification of Weber's teaching. But to Garfinkel, and this is where we see the importance of his jury work, sociology itself is another level of this accountable order. We aren't able to see outside of practical methods because we are currently employing them as we do social science. Ethnomethodology treats the practice of social science as it does any other method of doing social order. We are spinning plates, too. Sociology, too, is part of this moral order. There is no outside. This is a crucial point. For Parsons, ethical attachments are what binds us to the social system. For Garfinkel, explaining how we come to have those moral attachments and explaining how ethics tie any social situation together is the point of sociology. We can locate the active nature of the moral order by trying to poke holes in it. Here we come to Garfinkel's famous breaching experiments. Here I've given you a picture of a bull in a china shop, from the expression whereby delicate china will be destroyed by such a wild creature. Like the metaphor of spinning plates, this helps describe Garfinkel's breaching experiments. During his time at UCLA, he wanted to see how far he could push social order while people were still accountable to it. So effectively, he sent out his students to wreak havoc on social organization, to push it to its limits. 
Thus, his dictum you see here. Procedurally, it is my preference to start with familiar scenes and ask what can be done to make trouble. One particularly awful experiment was where they would place a student in a room to talk to a psychologist on the other end of the shortwave radio. They'd have to answer yes or no questions, and the psychologist would reply to them. Or so they thought. In fact, the response was a pre-programmed list of answers. If you read the transcript, the person on the other end of the radio was trying to make sense of what is complete nonsense, but to them represents an ongoing, sensible, and somehow knowable dialogue. Here, we see that there is a presumption of reciprocated moral attachments. So to make sense of the image I've shown you, for Garfinkel, the best time to understand the successful routine operation of the china shop is to notice how long it can be maintained with the bull in it. He's not just trying to troll the people of Los Angeles in his breaching experiments, but showing us that social facts aren't just macro-scale things that exist at the level of society. They are put to work in any organized social setting. Let's think about the example of a car wreck. You collide with another vehicle, or a post. Everyone has to get out of their car and assess the damage. Assuming everybody's okay, you need to come up with a story for what happened to report to the police or your insurer. Like a jury, you need to sort out the relevant information from what isn't, who has followed the rules of the road, who hasn't. You need to exchange information you will later use for your insurance claim. Most of this is not internal to the situation of the two cars colliding. You come up with an account of social order right after it happens. Recording the car wreck is as social as the collision itself. Being at fault is as much about coming up with a post-collision definition than the person who sped through the red light doing it. Garfinkel's point here is that it doesn't really do much to explain the car wreck as Parsons would, as a social action structure. What is more interesting is how people take the process and make it follow the established routine. Now you're ready to do the readings. I'd start with the encyclopedia entry first before reading Garfinkel's piece. Read it twice. It's a tough one. Here, I want you to think about the work that Garfinkel has been doing on juries, and I also want you to think about how he's slowly moving away from the work of Parsons. See you in the next video.